All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. But the QA is the important part because that stands for question and answer, and we like to kick off our week get started, uh, uh, get our tech week started with some fun, interactive conversations, a little back and forth, a little dialogue. I'm already seeing a, an incredible group of geeks in the chat today. Uh, McCorkerin, Q3 Becker, Boeing Bike, Copy Cash, Simon Says Hypno, got Gary the Fireman, I've highlighted his comment here, Al Sabakli, uh, Dave Burns, Two Turbo, Sammy, Sammy, what's up, bud? Uh, Gorm Lord, <clears throat> Boeing Bite. We've we've got like, we've got the whole crew. We got a good crew. We're, we're I think we're gonna have fun today, and uh, <laughs> Gorm Lord, the gadget guy, get it right. So that is actually the joke. Um, you know, when when you try to be sort of jokingly modest, you know, I, the the whole thing, especially starting with some audio guy, because it was the mystery of. I wasn't allowed to have social media while I was working at a talent agency, so I was just some random audio guy, and I kind of kept that moniker because, you know, I want to be presumptuous. I'm not the gadget guy. I'm just some gadget guy. You know, take what I say, take it or leave it. It's all up to you. Uh, JMX Warrior, what's up, buddy boy? <laughs> Uh, Dave Burns, lies and slander. The only thing we are is uncredible. Uh, and, ooh, Lost Divine? Lost Divine? Uh, Monday already. It, it comes it comes around like clockwork. Just come, Monday just comes around to stooge slap you into another week. But, um, <laughs> Gorm Lord, I like that villain uh, origin story. So, um, we, we've got... We've got a really heavy news block show today, but this is the day before uh, we get the official word. We take the wraps off of the OnePlus 10 Pro. I'm going to leave it up to the chat. So last week, we were right before the Galaxy S21 FE announcement. We've had kind of an entire week to sort of pick at that phone. I don't have one. I have miserable experiences with Samsung PR. I have zero interest in picking one up. So if we want to talk about the S21 FE in the second half of the show in the gadget block, um, we can we, we can try to do that. Uh, I'm gonna leave it up to you. Once we get through the uh, the subreddit plug, if, if that's something y'all wanna do, we can add it to the list. I'm not particularly impressed. I'm just gonna front load that right now. And Al Sabakli, what is up? Gifting out a bunch of tier one subs. Let's see. Al hit Bray Gray, Matt Tyler, Muppinish, Last Divine, and sorry for bad English tier one subs. Thank you so much. That is that is incredibly generous of you. Thank you so much for supporting uh, the stream and the podcast and, and the channel. It's it's uh, it's people like you that are keeping me going these days. And Barry Johnson's in the in the chat. Everyone say hey to Barry Johnson. And Simon says hypno S21 FE equals why bother. Um, oh, and McCorkran, yeah, definitely. I think this one's hilarious. Hold on, let me pull this up. Uh, when Samsung does it, it's fine. But uh, McCorkran writes, I do think it's interesting how the media all of a sudden is okay with six gigabytes of RAM in a device. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, it's probably optimization and Samsung magic juice that makes it font. But if another phone had six giga gigabits of RAM, that would be a deal breaker and them ripping off their customers. <coughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I've, I've, I've written at length about my issues with Samsung, Samsung PR and especially sort of not Samsung users. Again, it's like I need to be really careful. And I think 2022 is definitely going to be a course correction year for me because I really want people in general to get more use and more longevity out of all their gadgets. I think this year in 2022, I'm going to be talking a lot about phones from 2018, 2019 that they're still around. They're still kicking and they're still incredibly powerful. And so, like, like, for example, I took uh, some time last night just to kind of keep updating. This is my Xperia 5, 
my Xperia 5 Mark I, the, the original one that doesn't have a headphone jack. And I'm going through all these Android updates. It's a little behind on security patches. It's running Android 11, but it's on the October security patch. This is a screamer phone. I mean, it's still a really good phone. If I were using this today, I'd be a little concerned about the battery health and then everything else is still pretty much fine. So getting into some of this commentary, I think the company that, oh, Nvidia just moved me all around my office. Um, the company that's sort of most responsible for devaluing premium Android devices is Samsung. They play so many games with trade-in offers and immediate sales after they launch at really, really high MSRP. It gives the entire uh, Android premium market kind of a, a bad, it's a bad look. I think it's a bad look. And it sort of encourages people like, hey, if I'm flush with cash and I want to buy a nice phone, I better buy that iPhone because it's really nice. So get, getting through this year, I really want to separate the commentary about businesses and mega corporations and billion dollar companies, maybe trillion dollar companies from the end users. Someone owns a Samsung phone, I still want them to really get their money's worth. Along the way, I want to point out, hey, depending on what you like to do, you might have a better fit phone than that Samsung. Or if that Samsung really was the right gadget, let's make sure you're getting everything out of it that, um, that you can. <laughs> Sorry, I just missed an entire just sort of rundown on OnePlus. Because this is, again, it's, it's, it's the, the constant joke of my podcast is just how emotional and how lacking of data so much of this commentary is. But, but Dave Burns writing, one plus hot my free wings is uh, kind of cracking me up right now. So <laughs> let's, let's get into some housekeeping. Uh, let, let's really chew through this news block. There's so much in the news block. And I kind of liked the flow of last week being a little bit more condensed. So I'm going to try and keep this all to under two hours if I can just so that my voice can sustain and I can get um, I can get some uh, some other videos out this week and not fall into laryngitis. Gary the Fireman gifting a tier one sub to Ray Mondet. Gary the Fireman, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, apparently there's a hype train close. So if, if you've got bits to use, uh, that would be the time to use. I'm so bad at Twitch. I'm really awful. I, I, I'm really not good at any of this. So And I'm back. Yeah, someone just tell me if I'm back. <laughs> We're going to keep it really simple. And then uh, my stream crashes. <laughs> I'm, showing, I'm showing video and I'm showing audio again. So uh, yes, yes, we're back. All right. Uh, apparently, it's going to be one of those weeks. Um, we did the same thing. Uh, we, we had a really, a, a pretty decently stable stream. Uh, <laughs> did he poof after saying he was bad at Twitch? Yes. Yes, he did. Um, fingers crossed. This this entire podcast is held together by, like, chewed up bubblegum and off-brand duct tape. Uh, housekeeping is pretty simple last week. I, I'm sort of in between a bunch of videos and trying to get, like, I'm still trying to get that Surface Duo camera um, review out. I, I just rewrote the entire script. I, I, I had a completely fundamentally different question and a change of heart. And so hopefully that'll be out this week. Um, getting into the two main videos I got out last week, a review on the OnePlus Buds Z2. Uh, the OnePlus 10 is right around the corner. So if you, uh, if you're maybe thinking of picking up a phone without a headphone jack, I'm sure OnePlus would appreciate you throwing some of these in your shopping cart alongside your brand new OnePlus. And then this one was really fun. This was a, an extremely difficult video to put together because I shoot everything solo all by myself. But um, I've been spending a little bit more time trying to dig into mobility tech, like e-scooters, e-bikes. I'd like to start tackling a bit more lifestyle. And so Okai sent over their Neon. This is the Okai Neon electric scooter. And uh, I've been using it for quick jaunts around town, sort of the last mile commuting idea where you don't want to jump into a gas powered car just to drive a half mile to go pick up some groceries. That's extremely fuel inefficient. It's bad for the environment. 
And this is fun. You know, I get a little fresh air. I'm on my feet. I'm zipping around my neighborhood. And uh, for, for a, a decently specced out electric scooter, I was actually very impressed with how it, um, how it handled the new hills. The, I mean, the hills in my neighborhood. The hills aren't new. My neighborhood is really old. <laughs> but the hills are new to me. Um, so yeah, a, a reasonably priced, again, for the price of like a mid-range smartphone, you can have this kind of well laid out mobility experience and you can kind of zip around town. Uh, I did a number of shorts and a podcast appearance on reviews.org, just wrapping up CES coverage. And of course, best of our week, uh, the show that we run, that TK and I run, the show we run every Thursday, uh, TK was able to kind of secure a bit of a stream uh, last week. We had a great chat just, uh, just, just kind of chatting out some of his experiences talking about uh, companies at CES that he really enjoyed. We spent most of the time talking about TCL and uh, Nextoc. The announcements at Nextoc were particularly exciting to me, especially given the mission that I'm trying to engage with, that you should get more use out of your uh, out of your gadgets. Aw, oh, Jeff, thanks, buddy. And Jeff just subscribed at a, at a tier one. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff says we says we need more scooter content from Juan. So the next thing I really need to do. There are some incredible mountain biking trails in this new neighborhood. I am a city guy. I would much prefer being in like a condensed urban three story walk up condo. You know, like walk downstairs, find a little, you know, uh, food cart, walk right back upstairs. That, that's, that's how I'm programmed. But that we're a little bit more rural than we used to be, uh, you know, buying the place that we're in right now, I'm at least gonna get to benefit from some incredible mountain biking, dirt trails, uh, hiking, that kind of stuff. So an electric mountain bike to me just sounds like an awesome, awesome time. Uh, I used to be a mountain biking instructor when I was a Boy Scout. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of dabble a little bit more with that. Again, just the whole notion you can pop on, you know, you can hop on a bike, start pedaling away, motor assist, get up to like 25 or 30 miles an hour so that you're not completely in the way of traffic. I mean, it's, it's really cool stuff. And especially at the current prices for this kind of tech, it's pretty remarkable. Ah, C2 Turbo, I have an EMTB, and it is amazing. So, citation given, confirmed. And yeah, Jeff, exactly. I, I really want either a really nice electric road bike or a good, big, monster, fat tire um, electric uh, uh, dirt bike. Not, yeah, you know what I mean. Electric powered or hybrid electric motored mountain bike. And Chatty Boy, okay, so one of the companies, Okai, actually reached out again. Now that I finished the Neon, so Chatty Boy writes, let's all get Vespas. Uh, Okai makes a little seated uh, electric scooter. It looks like a Vespa. When I was younger, when I was like 16, 17, I, I, I helped a friend um, rebuild the engine on a little Honda scooter. I wanted a Vespa just so bad. Like... I ended up getting a used Toyota Camry. Um, what I really wanted was a little, a little putt putt motor, uh, elect, uh, Vespa. And now you you can pick something like that up for I don't know eight hundred bucks somewhere in there. It's 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 under I think it's under a grand, and it is. It's a little seated uh, electric scooter. I think top speeds like maybe sixteen miles an hour, about a twenty five mile range. It's crazy. Again, like. This is one of those frontiers of technology that is rapidly, rapidly and aggressively uh, improving and prices are falling very, very quickly. All right. Um, yeah, so that's the crux of housekeeping. I managed to get housekeeping done in eight minutes. And I feel like that's a personal record. Is that a personal best? So, someone let me know. I mean, aside from the podcasts where I just don't do any housekeeping. So, um, yeah. Kudos to me, I'm going to drink some coffee. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Gary the Fireman, definitely a record. Dave Burns, new PR. <laughs> woo woo. Ba, ba, That's my soundboard right there. That's the only button I have on my soundboard is trumpet fanfare from the side of my face. <laughs> All right, let's jump into some news. Um... 
so last week or was it the week before we 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 had kind of a bit of a conversation just continuing um oh you know what no i'm gonna say let's switch this up i would like to start um the news block with something with something kind of funny uh especially in regards to some of the conversations we've had about right to repair. Oftentimes we get these little minor victories and then we suffer some setbacks. I wanted to highlight this one. So it was shared on the Discord. Um, I can't remember who shared it on the Discord, so I apologize. But um, it's always kind of nice when you see a business strategy that's kind of anti-consumer, but it's not really against the law. But the way that it's formatted eventually circles around and bites that company in the ass and bites them pretty hard. So we're in year two of component shortages, supply chain issues, silicon issues, and it's just it just feels good. There's a schadenfreude. I don't like being this cranky and bitter, but you know, they earned it. So I'm kind of happy that it happened. And now hopefully it'll also start biting more companies that engage in similar business practices because printers are a scam. Printer ink is ridiculous. And so this is coming by way of Boing Boing, written up by Rob Beshiza. Beshiza? I am so sorry, Rob. Forced by shortages to sell chipless ink cartridges, Canon tells customers how to bypass DRM warnings. It is vile that there is DRM hardware that goes on printer ink cartridges and reduces your ability to refill them or buy competing products. This is like the definition of anti-consumer, anti-competitive. It's just a, 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 an ever-ending hole of e-waste for these components. And it just feels good to see Canon go, hey, um, we can't make any of these anymore, so here's how you get around them. <laughs> Printer Inc. company Canon was forced by the silicon shortage to sell cartridges without the DRM chips used to dissuade customers from using third-party tanks. Accordingly, it is reportedly telling customers how to bypass its genuine ink BS. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is at least one step better than HP's ink scheme. Um, but yeah, if, if this were to fundamentally uh, change the business practices for printer ink. I might even consider getting like another photo printer. I always wanted a large, a home, large format photo printer, but I've never been on a deadline. So it's always been pretty easy and surprisingly inexpensive to get large prints from like a Costco. And they've all come out genuinely great. And it, for, for some of the longer lead times, like for my, for my folks, some of the photo, some of the gifts that we gave this year were large format canvas prints. And obviously I can't print those out at home. So it's, it's not really been mission critical to have one, but I'd like to, you know, in a pinch, it's two in the morning. I, I just want to have something and I can print it out and I can do it myself. I'd like to have my own large format photo printer or like hell, I'm ever going to buy something like that. The way that these companies sell their ink. So, um, yeah, it's just good. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, from Jeff. Sorry, Jeff's got two comments here. DRM caused so many repair issues when I was working in the printer copier repair field. They would put DRM chips on much more than just ink. They tried putting them on all consumable parts. Eventually, I feel like what they wanted to do was, you know, like, oh, if you want to use this, this business printer, you need to use HP paper, and each piece of paper has its own copy protection uh, DRM scheme to make sure you're getting the highest quality print that you can with the special fibers that absorb our ink, unlike any competitors are capable of, HP photo printer for the business people who care. <laughs> That's, that was my commercial for HP printers. There you go. Please stop giving them ideas. All right, moving on. So now we're getting into the heavier stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and roll through these because this is a follow-up and a continuation. Uh, we talked about politicians getting deplatformed from services like from from social media outlets like Twitter. Um, 
I, I feel like the people in here have heard me wax on and complain and soapbox about things like uh, for, uh, First Amendment issues and, and that how also um, the First Amendment kind of extends both ways. And so if you have a private platform, a privately owned platform like Twitter, there's a First Amendment protection for that platform that they don't have to publish things that they don't want to publish. And, and that is what deplatforming essentially is. They are exercising their First Amendment rights against compelled speech. You do not want a market where the government can force a private institution to publish things that they don't want to. Compelled speech is just as dangerous as, as uh, being locked up for free speech types of issues. Compelled speech is a free speech kind of issue. The, the ability to legally not say something is a very valuable protection um, under the law. You, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> It's just, again, I feel like this is basic law and order, right? Law and order season one. <laughs> so it should be pretty easy to grasp. Um, we have a massive issue understanding the mechanisms of disinformation campaigns and spreading bad information that hurts people, divides communities, and uh, reduces the effectiveness of things like um, scientific research and uh, disease responses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got to take a quick drink of water here. <laughs> Simon says, no, I refuse my right to be silent. So when we get good data, we kind of need to dig into it a little bit. I'm not going to go through the study. It'll be linked, all of the links, everything that we're going to be talking about on the show notes this week on somegadgetguy.com. Online parenting communities pulled closer to extreme groups spreading misinformation during COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a study, a published study from the George Washington University. Um, new research shows how potentially dangerous misinformation can spread and why Facebook's efforts to control that spread is not working. So hold on. Let me get to here. By studying social media at an unprecedented scale, we have uncovered why mainstream communities such as parents have become flooded with misinformation during the pandemic and where it comes from. Uh, later in this sort of brief on the study, our results call into question, sorry, I just wanna get the quotes. Our results call into question any moderation approaches that focus on the largest and hence seemingly most visible communities as opposed to the smaller ones that are better embedded. Clearly, combating online conspiracy theories and misinformation cannot be achieved without considering these multi-community sources and conduits. So to uh, poorly uh, TLDR, and, and I, would, I, I, would, I would hope people check out the actual brief, not just you know, this write up or me sort of surmising it in a cliff notes kind of way. But there were two main camps of organizations that would kind of feed information into really, really small and entrenched parent communities. And they had differing um, ideologies or differing goals. You know, some of them were more like conspiracy theory, some of them were more um, active, like anti vax, anti science kinds of kinds of feeders. But it's these tiny, tiny, tiny little pocket communities that serve as the incubators. So th this information funnels through those tiny little parent communities. It kind of festers in there for a while, and then it kind of pops like a boil. It kind of blisters into the larger, more visible communities. And so by the time that you're trying to combat the spread of misinformation visibly, it's way too late. It is like an infection, you know, the, the, the smaller communities are done. The people in those communities are sort of gone. It's, it's so much more difficult to bring those people back once that idea has kind of taken root, once bad information has, has sort of lodged in that brain. So again, we have an idea. I, I think anyone in this, in, in this chat right now would, would have an understanding or, or, or would appreciate, um, like we, we'd have a feeling that this is kind of the process that bad actors, uh, foreign governments, and people with crazy or authoritarian uh, goals would, would try to target susceptible communities. We, I think we kind of know that. 
But until we have good data on the actual mechanisms of that spread, it's much, much harder to try and prevent that or to try and end run around it or to try and get better educational materials out there, better ideas out there. So this is, this is one of those valuable studies that helps us describe the actual process for how this stuff um, takes root and how this stuff is eventually uh, distributed. And it's, it's, it's pretty gross. Um, let me get this out of the way here. <laughs> um, oh, or actually, this is a great point from, from, from David, too. It's not even media literacy. Basic web literacy is a huge barrier entry. So many people see Facebook as their portal to the internet, and that is very dangerous. It's easy, and it's convenient, and that's where all my friends are. And it's funny, because again, we keep telling that joke over and over again, like, you know, my parents were so into stranger danger, but so many of their peers just believe everything that they see. <laughs> on Facebook that sort of confirms their feelings on things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty rough. Hmm. So there's something going on with Matt Tyler and Matt Tyler 90. So I'm just gonna time that out for a bit. Cool. So Matt, maybe check your accounts and stuff so that we can see what's going on. As much fun as it is to see you talk to yourself in, in my podcast, uh, we're gonna move on because uh, we were talking about understanding the mechanics of how misinformation spreads. I love this article. I'm, I'm, I'm only gonna kind of highlight the top of this article because I think the photo that the Telegraph chose um, is hilarious. So this is coming by way of the Telegraph Sweden launches psychological defense agency to counter propaganda from Russia and China. The new agency is tasked with countering disinformation and boosting the population's resilience in the face of possible influence operation. Okay, that sounds cool, right? Like we need a team of, of crack cyber, uh, you know, folks who can fight off cyber propaganda from Russia and China. So what photo does the Telegraph pick to show off like Sweden's cyber intelligence? All right, just, just let me know if I'm back. <laughs> this is gonna be rough. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm really bad at Twitch now. Uh, I, I, I don't know if PC reboot is really going to fix anything. I, I mean, I'm not even seeing like restream wigging out on me. So anyway, um, what photo does the Sweden use, uh, does the Telegraph use to show off their new psychology cyber initiative? A bunch of dudes in tactical gear with guns. That's how you get Telegraph readers. It's not that nerdy stuff with like keyboards and mice and computers. Nah, what we got, we got guns. It's ABBA with guns. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Gary, I too. I love the interwebs. <laughs> Two turbo, exactly. Uh, you know, you just shoot the computer until Russians can't interfere. Which, again, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm almost positive that a number of those 5G um, conspiracy theories... Uh, came out of like Russian interference because you convince a, a population that 5G is bad for you and causes cancer. So then they run out and they torch cell phone towers and you have just destabilized that country's communication network. Again, it, I mean, to me, that's pretty clear whether or not it, it originated in Russia. I could totally see a couple like, you know, Russian trolls being like, <laughs> this is hilarious. Watch what we can do. Look, look, they're going to go and blow up their own data centers. <laughs> so yes, increasingly what we need is counter efforts. And, and the next phase of this, you know, we, have to, we have to factor psychological combat into the whole next round of, of data initiatives. You know, there, there's, there's going to be like cyber threats where you hack into uh, like a, a power distribution node and you can shut off power for a community of people. Like that, that is a, a targeted 
cyber warfare tactic. On top of that, though, you can also infiltrate a community with bad data and get them to work counter to their own self-interests. Like, maybe in a population of people that would really benefit from getting vaccines in the middle of a global pandemic, you convince them not to and to go out and spread more disease, further destabilizing that country's uh, healthcare uh, network and their economy, which could later cause a, a market crash for that country. I'm just spitballing. It would be terrible if that were really happening. Of course, this is just the ramblings of some dude on the internet. So there you go. Ah. <laughs> Matt, ironic that we're talking about hacking right now. I'm just saying, dude. I'm just saying. All right. Uh, moving right along. Uh, again, in this whole uh, scheme of, of privacy and security and protecting your own online, um, online identity and online behavior, uh, this was a Reddit post from R You Should Know. Just, I felt it was worth reiterating. You know, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to start closing out some tabs because I don't think it's a RAM issue, but just in case Chrome is killing my Threadripper with 64 gigs of RAM, um, I wouldn't put it past Chrome. <laughs> um, this is from R. You should know. There is a Verizon Wireless, uh, oh wait, that if you are a Verizon Wireless customer in the US, a new program launched today called Verizon Custom Experience attracts every website you visit and every app you use. Program automatically enrolls all customers who must specifically opt out if they don't want to be tracked. So if you're a Verizon Wireless customer, they've got some links on where you can try to manage your online behavior tracking and data uh, identity. Now, I wanted to highlight this one. We're going to keep seeing individual little uh, posts like this pop up. The problem is not specific to Verizon. The problem is endemic to almost every single um, almost every single internet service provider in the country. The last administration and the last FCC really eroded the rules that protected consumer privacy. And it's just too profitable for ISPs to not sell off all your data. So if you want the comprehensive look at what the current market forces are and what the current trends are, Almost every single major ISP is engaged in what Verizon is doing right now, too. And they make it extremely convoluted to go through your customer service portals to try and just get a handle on what the nature of their policies are for data security and data privacy. So uh, what I would recommend is checking out the FTC. The FTC recently published a report. We talked about it on the podcast a while back, but we have to keep reminding people this is industry-wide. If you switch from Verizon to some other service provider, <laughs> like if you switch from Verizon to Comcast, you're in for the same kind of exploitation of your, of your online uh, sort of behavior. And again, it's all to their financial benefit because there aren't really any rules to stop them. So if they want to make more money on you as a customer, your data is apparently extremely lucrative. So um, yeah, the FTC published a, a very comprehensive and easy to read report. Again, it's not like you know government bureaucracy gobbledygook, gobbledygook. It's it's pretty clear. I think it's like seventy pages. It's a really easy read, um, and you know I'll add that to the show notes if folks want to check that out. But it, this is this is increasingly one of those issues that we can't quite fix until we have better regulation over the telecom space. And we had the, those protections better in place before the last head of the FCC basically threw away the FCC's ability to regulate this industry. In fact, some of the responses from FTC commissioners pointed to a lack of um, engagement from the FCC, that the FCC needed to get back into this spa space as a regulating uh, entity. So it's pretty rough. It's, it's pretty gross. Again, it's one of the things that I point to if you're a geek, it kind of does matter who's in office. I know a lot of people will say, oh, but both sides are terrible. And you know what? 
it seems to be really lopsided if you're a techie uh, what what side of the political spectrum has had a more consistent beneficial effect on telecommunication regulations and consumer protections and what side of the political aisle has really worked to obstruct and throw away uh, regulations and consumer protections. So uh, with that in mind, we've got a class action lawsuit brewing for Google. I know you're, you're probably like, but which one? Because <laughs> there are so many. Well, let me take another drink of coffee here. <laughs> Uh, oh, Ted, sorry. Yeah, I don't have links turned on in my Twitch chat, but that, that was really cool of you to try and supply that. Um, I, I'll, I'll add it to the show notes, man. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the FTC read is great. And he, he actually shared what the title of, the title of it is, a look at what ISP, ISPs know about you examining the privacy practices of six major internet service providers. All right. Uh, Google and class action. Let's let's get to it. All right. Google basically pays Apple to stay out of the search engine business, class action lawsuit alleges. Now, Apple has an agreement with Google that it won't develop its own internet search engine so long as Google pays it to remain the default option in Safari. Uh, filed in a California court earlier this week against Apple, Google, and their respective CEOs, the lawsuit alleges the two companies have a non-compete agreement in the internet search business that violates U.S. antitrust laws. So I've harped on about Apple in the past because I find Apple's communication to be disingenuous and sometimes intellectually dishonest. We don't profit off of your online behavior. That's Apple's sort of marketing, their commentary, their feel good. We protect your privacy and we don't profit from your data. We profit by letting Google profit from your data. And they profit to the tune, I believe, last year was something in the ballpark of $12 billion for Google to be the search engine behind Siri and to be the default search engine in Safari. So it would be really bad. And I feel like we need a market-correcting, punitive financial uh, reassessment of this relationship. If data were to be disclosed in court that alleged these companies were actively working together on carving up business in segments that would prevent competition, that would prevent other search engines from being equally uh, accessible to iOS consumers, and that Apple themselves were also leveraging their customer base against Google to continue getting these payouts. That to me is almost organized crime style back scratching. Hey, it would be a shame if all these iPhone owners, you know, they pick up their iPhone, they're like, hey, I need to search for, uh, you know, a taquito recipe. Hey, hey, I can get that on Bing. Oh, what's this duck, duck, go? I, oh boy, sure would, you know, if you, uh, you take care of us, we'll take care of you, Google. You know what I'm saying? Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, oh. I started watching The Sopranos again. <laughs> that was my absolutely awful um, situation. <laughs> ah. So, uh, moving right along. Let me get this. Uh, oh, good. Matt is Matt again. I guess. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Sorry, I'll read that next to Ditya. Uh, me. Hey, Siri, how much do you make from Google? Siri, here's a search result that doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Ted, scratch, uh, scratch your back. We'll scratch yours. And Aditya Anil, this is a terrible. Don't, don't, don't encourage me like this. Juan's gangster voice is very inspired. That's a very polite way of saying that I have a terrible gangster voice. So um, where are we at the gadget? Oh, no, I've got two stories here that I do want to run down here real quick. Um, again, we're talking about privacy and the, the um, sort of the lengths that companies go to market privacy when they don't really live up 
to the uh, the standard that their marketing sets. Hold on, I'm gonna clear these links. And uh, this is another one. We, we talked about this, uh, I can't remember when. I wanna say it was a couple weeks back. Um, Air tags being used by car thieves to sort of track high-end automobiles. Um, we totally predicted that air tags were going to be used for nefarious purposes, and another story has come out. This one courtesy of the New York Post. A model stalked in New York City after a stranger slips air tag into her coat pocket, and she details on her Instagram. She she had a little Instagram video detailing a, a kind of a scary incident where she she wasn't able to keep track of her coat. Someone slipped an air tag into her pocket. She was walking around for a significant period of time before that air tag finally alerted her iPhone. Oh, by the way, there's someone tracking your location. You are in the proximity of an air tag and have been for quite a while. So even from the iPhone perspective, while it's great that the air tag eventually notified her, this is not a good operating standard for a location tracking device. And I think it just further goes to show Apple, again, in Apple trying to make this a pr proprietary standard that would only benefit iOS consumers, they've completely wrecked, you know, sort of the privacy and security of, of every other gadget. There is no ping from an AirTag that will alert an Android phone that someone is tracking their location. So that's terrible already. Apple immediately, upon creation of this tech, should have reached out to the Bluetooth SIG um, to create some kind of ping. You know, just like when you open up your earbuds and your phone goes, oh, hey, there are new earbuds here. Do you want to pair with them? There should be an immediate, you are in the proximity of a location tracking device, ping for all Bluetooth, for all Bluetooth devices especially ones that seem to follow you for any given period of time. So already that's bad enough. That's bad enough. A Apple is purposely making this product in a way that only benefits iPhone owners and can be used to great detriment against other uh, operating systems. That does not make me want to do business with Apple. That does not make me want to buy an iPhone just so I can protect myself against AirTags. Like, that's the opposite of what we should be doing. Now, it also seems like it doesn't even do a great job of protecting iOS users. <laughs> like, this woman ostensibly had an AirTag on her person that was not assigned to her account for a significant period of time that almost gave up, you know, her home, where she lives. You know, like, that... Is, is is even doubly bad. Not only does it, it not only is it purposely built to, to only enrich iOS users, it's not even done well. <laughs> so again, like we talked about with AirTags being used, you know, for, for stealing cars, uh, when AirTags first came out and people were complaining about, hey, these, these are, are not well done. There are ways to do this and in, 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 in disclose to your customers what the actual relationship is and, and what the security implications are. You have not done your due diligence. And a bunch of people kind of shrugged it off. Oh, but Apple always does this and they're the best and they have privacy. You know, Apple, Apple cares about privacy. They're not good at it. They're really not. And, and this is exactly the type of, of uh, sort of... Uh, ugly use that we predicted and it turns out that that's totally true like again who could have predicted this except for all of the people who were concerned about the implementation of this air tag and it's totally the way that people are abusing them <sighs> it's it's just yeah so again this this needs to be like a bigger headline day for rights apple doxed a model what a company um the only way that Apple is going to make this better is by being shamed into making it better and, and to the point where they potentially start losing what sales they would have had on AirTags. They have no incentive to make these things better if you've got a bunch of Apple apologists just going, oh, but everyone else is worse. What about, uh, what about other companies that are worse? No. 
Apple claims to be a market leader. They're a three trillion dollar corporation. They they need to be taken to cat to task much more publicly, so that other companies will also learn not what not to do. <laughs> Don't do it like this if you have a business model that you're trying to occur. Samsung is looking at this and going, yeah, but we've got these other products just like Apple. So let's make sure Samsung doesn't do the same thing. Um, that, that's the kind of pressure we need to keep on, on, this type of, on this type of market. Exactly. The only thing I can, I can glean from this, Gary, absolutely correct. Apple supports creepy ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends who stalk their exes. I mean, that's the, only, that's the only conclusion I can draw, right? Apple is totally into abusive relationships and stalking. They must be, because AirTags have not been fixed. You heard it here first, folks. <sighs> oh, <laughs> Paul, it's not like I want people to feel bad about that kind of stuff. Uh, Paul says, I make myself feel better by covering all my Apple logos with a D brand skin. I, I mean, like, again, the mission is I want you to like your gadgets for what they really are. Um, the marketing on Apple products is, has always been highly emotional and kind of suspect. And this is a perfect example of not really achieving what the messaging says it is. <laughs> Matt Tyler, extreme skins. Uh, all right, all right, Matt. Yeah, cool, cool your heels there. <laughs> um, last, last story, and this isn't, you know, I'm not going to preface this. I'm not going to give it a lead up. Let's just jump right into this so that we can get into the subreddit plug. The news block has gone on long enough. Uh, Governor Newsom signs executive order outlawing price gouging of COVID-19 at-home test kits in California. So this is an executive order where, hold on, I got to get down to, um, the order announced Saturday prohibits, seller, prohibits sellers from increasing previous prices for the self-test kits by more than 10%. Uh, quote, sellers who have not previously sold at-home COVID-19 tests may not sell testing kits for a price that is greater than 50% of what the seller paid to acquire the testing kit. Um, any violation of the executive order could result in a misdemeanor charge punishable by a fine of up to $1,000 or imprisonment for up to six months or both. Um, <clears throat> violations would also run afoul of the unfair competition law, which is subject to a penalty of $2,500 per violation. So the reason why I bring this up is because I am a bleeding heart liberal and I believe in the power of big government. We've been going through... Uh, uh, two years of supply chain issues, um, of middlemen, of price gouging, of you know GPUs being sold way above MSRP, and we see, keep seeing these little gleam, these little glimmers of potential for some kind of legislation to try and crack down on scalpers, on bots, on people that exist only to manipulate markets for their own personal financial benefit. We're having, we're, we're going about this in a very clumsy way, IMO, where we're looking at individual products. Hey, right now, in this moment, it's difficult to get at-home test kits for COVID-19 testing. Okay, let's sign an executive order about these test kits. All right, well, what about this PPE? Or what about these kinds of masks? Or what about these types of rubber gloves? What about this type of cleaning solution? What about these types of vitamin supplements and medications? What about, what about, what about, what about? The entire crux of the pandemic has been shortages, supply issues, distribution issues. And, and that's just like getting a good mask has been a part of this entire conversation. I really feel we're long overdue scalper laws, like the way that we tried to write laws for things like concert ticket scalping. Again, we've got a, a law called the unfair competition law, and I think it's time to revisit a low-level federal standard that operates punitively, punitively, that's a hard word for me to say, 
Um, for anyone who exists solely to jack up the price of a product in between the initial seller and the customer. Shouldn't matter if it's a COVID-19 test. Shouldn't matter if it's a PlayStation 5. Shouldn't matter if it's a fancy new motherboard or a GPU or sterilized gloves or medically rated masks. If you enter into the market solely to constrain supply, jack up the price, create more um, barriers for customers to buy that product only to benefit yourself, I feel you probably deserve some prison time. Right now, this is the reality of the world that we're living in and the difficulties we found getting products or protective gear or uh, proactive COVID testing gear to the consumers that need them. And I feel like we need to make this so unfashionable and so painful that people strongly reconsider their desire to be resellers of this kind of, 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 of anything, really. I, I, I have the lowest opinion of someone who buys up a pallet of PlayStation 5s just so they can sell them at like an 80 or 100% markup on eBay. That person deserves every bit of ill will, of, of ire, of criticism, uh, to be made to be mocked to be made fun of to, to be run out of town tarred and feathered <laughs> like in the digital uh metaphorical sense not in the actual physical sense but this is where we need to seriously reconsider how we've crafted laws regulating retail strategy so that's th that that's a massive problem as i see it i, I don't know any other way around it we're gonna keep signing individual executive orders. We're gonna craft a piece of legislation on concert ticket scalpers. Okay, well that same business practice affects everything else. So if we at least make it like, <laughs> at least like some kind of federal felony, then it's immediately gonna have an effect on the market of people who are thinking, hey, you know what? I got a couple grand kicking around. What I could do, I could buy up all these masks and then sell them at like five times the price. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hurt people and make money. We, we've, gotta, we've gotta figure that out. Yeah, Matt, I, again, it's, it, I feel like you've summed it up. If, if you're a person that buys in bulk and sells expensive, you're a turd and you do not deserve to be alive, especially on medicines. Um, so Simon says, no, this, this is what's tricky. And, and this is why my bleeding heart liberalism probably needs someone to check it, right? Um, Simon Says Hypno writes, a fair profit is fine, gouging is not. And we would need an outside commission to kind of verify, you know, someone is in this and they're actively acting as distribution for markets or for communities that are underserved. Okay, so let's say you're in the, you're, you're in like rural Georgia. It has got to be exceedingly difficult to get good components, good data, good PPE, good medicine out to that area. So someone needs to be fairly compensated for loading up a truck and driving out to a local community store where they know sales are going to be really, really low. There needs to be a balance. Like I'm not saying anyone who wants to resell should be thrown in jail. What, I, what I'm saying is finding finding the line where that crosses into exploitation man this is rough so finding that line where we cross over from you know, sort of running a healthy business or exploiting people is extremely difficult to kind of get a handle on. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but I think we need to, to kind of come in hitting harder and then kind of walk back, find where the subtleties lie. Unfortunately, I think we need to take a broadsword approach, um, really chill the market out for a bit and then work backwards and find where there can be some subtlety in, in, in how we line all that stuff up. 
Oh, yeah. And and so Simon says, Hypno says, I agree with you, Juan, but the rot starts at the top. They have no interest in when their noses are buried in the trough. Yes. And and so that's kind of what I mean is, is like you hit hard. You, you sort of slow some of the ugliest aspects of it. And then you start trying to look at, well, who, who actually has a business model that will better support or sustain? And then you can kind of redraw the lines afterwards. Again, no law should ever be sacrosanct. It's never carved in stone. All of this should be fluid and mobile and adapt to the realities of what we're facing right now. And the realities of what we're facing right now are costing people lives on top of them not being able to buy PlayStation 5s. <laughs> Gary Bezos is not liking JCB's rant. Maybe that's why my Twitch stream is going down so often. Take that, Twitch. Ooh. All right, so um, that's going to wrap us up for the news block. I'm going to clear out some more links. Um, just a really quick subreddit plug. Every podcast has a subreddit. Mine is no exception, but my subreddit is focused on trying to help promote and uh, share content that we feel deserves more attention. We finally wrapped up the smartphone elimination challenge. It was a bracket of 36 companies. I was really excited about this because I purposely left off Samsung and Apple because I'm a jerk and I'm, again, a, 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 a hater, a Sam Apple hater. But we, um, we, sorry, I'm trying to get the, the link up here. I'm, I'm like really anxious, like anything I might do might crash the stream again. Uh, we, we put together a bracket of all the alternative companies and it was really exciting because so many people were coming to this bracket going, oh yeah, I forgot they even made phones. You know, all of these tech enthusiasts that had no idea about half of these companies and then seeing like how every day people were sort of supporting or voting against individual companies. It was a lot of fun, but we finally got to the conclusion. It came down to a shocking ending. I, if, if you would ask me, like, hey, if you have to bet your entire family's financial future on one company making it to the end of this bracket, what company do you think it would be? I would have said Xiaomi, but Xiaomi went out in the top four. So Xiaomi did not make it to the final two. The, the, the final vote for reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles came down to Google versus Sony. I mind blown just so if uh if we go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles for the next week i'm gonna leave it up just because it was a ton of work for me to put this bracket together and check on it every day mostly every day i missed a couple days uh, especially i would take sundays off um but we eventually got down to the end of the bracket and the winner of the smartphone elimination challenge is sony the Sony Xperia ended up being the strongest alternative brand of the year, of 2021. And I think it was a pretty strong year. Uh, we got Xperia 1 Mark III, we got the Xperia Pro I, even the Sony mid-rangers were pretty decent. Uh, that whole bracket came down. Um, Google versus Xperia, uh, or Pixel versus Xperia, Google versus Sony. And it was with a decent margin in the vote. So Google ended up picking up 54% of the vote. So yeah, it was very exciting. Um, it, was, it was an interesting year for Google. Again, launching the Pixel 6 and Tensor and all that fun stuff. And then, like I said, Xperia Pro I is such a monster device. Um, it, if you're really looking at what a pro phone should be, um, it, 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 was, it was a pretty crazy uh, offering. Uh, especially for photo and journals, uh, photo professionals and journalists. So, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, McCorcoran, this is everyone's way of saying they want a, he a headphone jack and expandable storage. <laughs> and Raymond, it, we should, uh, you know, maybe we'll see a pixel fold and the vote will change up for 2022. I don't know if a folding phone is really going to highlight, again, well, first of all, the community at Glowing Rectangles seems to be a bit broader than just everything Samsung does is the best. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, if folding phones are really going to be... I should put out a poll. We'll, we'll see. Like, what are your folding phone expectations for 2022? Um, Paul, Sony still makes phones? Question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point. Um, 
from Steve. I remember a famous YouTuber saying last year that Sony should stop making phones. Um, yeah, yeah, it was pretty hilarious. Still, one of the most toxic uh, articles I've ever written. It made me feel bad writing a, a, a response to that commentary. And it was, it was on the Xperia 5 Mark II. So yeah, um, not great. Not great. So, um, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. We need your support. We need sharing. Again, any one of the creators that's on this subreddit, we're, they're on that subreddit because someone believes their content deserves more attention. And it's that active participation that's going to help people out. So, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Keep upvoting. We're getting great upvotes. Keep dropping comments so we can get into discussions. You know, sort of work... SEO to our favor, and we can keep a broader community of tech fans as opposed to letting the subreddit descend into just whatever Apple does is going to get the most clicks and that's how you make money. We can, we can really support our hobby. You know, this is a lifestyle to me. This is something I really enjoy. I don't want to see it, you know, kind of descend into the lowest common denominator, average consumers, because I'm not average. I'm not a basic reviewer. I enjoy driving any product I get to its absolute limit and seeing what you can do with it. And I feel most of the people in this chat are, are probably of similar ideology. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. And I thank you for your support. <laughs> I need to start doing like, like ad rolls and stuff like that. <laughs> Matt, I seriously doubt it. Um, HTC makes a comeback to the glo global market with a foldable that blows all the others out of the water. Future breaking news right here, I hope. L-O-L. <laughs> and Aditya, I, again, I kind of feel people watching a stream like this would, would, would feel likewise. I ain't average. I can confidently say that after four years of contemplation. Um, I don't understand why anyone would want to be. Uh, you spend your hard-earned money on gadgets why? I'm not going to begrudge someone who just wants to own something expensive because it looks expensive, but that's not the community I can make videos for. You know, I, I, I can't talk you up on a $5,000 purse. Someone else is going to have to handle that. I want to make videos for people that put that money to aggressive use. So, um... I want to start off the gadget block with one other article that's still kind of newsy, but still sort of relates to the products that we use. And it created kind of a stir. And I'm, I'm sort of curious what reactions are in this chat. And, and I, want, I want to spend a little time kind of going through comments here. So the Wall Street Journal publishes this article and it gets immediately shared by Google VPs. As, as sort of a talking point on community and uh, bullying and peer pressure. And so I'm gonna just kind of highlight the title of this. Why Apple's iMessage is winning, teens dread the green text bubble. The iPhone maker cultivated iMessage as a must have texting tool for teens. Android users trigger a just a little less cool green bubble, quote, ew, that's gross. And this is kind of following up on the news that like, Something around 80% of new teenager smartphone consumers are using an iPhone. And, and that to me is a, uh, and again, we're mostly talking about the U.S. market here, but that to me is, is a damning situation where if you get those younger users really entrenched in one operating system or one environment, it's increasingly unlikely that you're going to be able to sway those consumers to considering their options later in life. It just works. I'm familiar with it. Why would I switch teams? My text messages are a different color now. Ugh, now I can't participate with my peers. And there is something kind of insidious about it. Like we just went and talked about AirTags. If you create a product that purposely breaks experiences for outside the wall consumers, you can keep your customer base a bit more entrenched and it does become a social pressure to own this gadget. You know, again, I don't believe Samsung makes the best products and that's why they're the most successful in the Android space in the United States. I believe Samsung spends the most on marketing 
and spends the most on sweetheart deals for carriers to position their products up front, and they buy their market presence through those types of initiatives more than their products are objectively better than the competition. Especially lately, if we're gonna talk about the Galaxy S21 FE. So it's not a meritocracy. It's not the best products really rise to the occasion. It's who spends the most on shoving their products under a customer's nose. And that's a valid business strategy, but that's not exciting to me as a techie. I'm not into this to talk about who has the best marketing. I'm into this to talk about different gadgets that do different things for different consumers and really getting the best possible fit. So I'd be curious, you know, this, this article goes up, Google VPs start retweeting it saying, Hey, you know, like there are issues with bullying in our society. There are issues with social dynamics in our society. And Apple has stonewalled all efforts to try and improve on this situation. And it created this huge backlash of, of Apple users vehemently defending their position as iOS customers to say, well, we don't want Android users to have iMessage. So it wasn't about, we wanna be able to communicate with people better. It was, we want to exclude all of the people that might be a little bit different than us. So um, let, let me, let me kind of catch back up with the, the chat here and see, see what kind of comments we've got. Do, 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 <laughs> two turbo. Yeah, um, Android discrimination growing up was real. Uh, very bad for literally everyone. I hate brand worshiping. Um, again, I, and I think it's funny too, like I was listening to, I, I was listening to this girl hosted podcast um, talking about sort of adult dating in the 21st century and just how candid and how aggressive these two girls were saying like, hey, if I match with someone on Tinder and then I text them and it shows up green, I basically just, I basically just write them off. Or I'll make fun of them. You're like, why is your text message the wrong color? Why, why aren't you using an iPhone? And you're like, these are two, two, I shouldn't say girls. I, mean, I think they're two ladies in their late 20s. And you're like, you're still in the dating scene categorizing potential dates by what phone they're using. Oh, but they're going to break my iMessage. And again, it's, it's so sort of insidiously rooted in the haves and the have nots. It's like a status or an elitist kind of a thing. I guarantee you one of those girls probably has like an iPhone 6S, right? You know, like you're not showing up to this date flashing wealth with your old iPhone, but you feel superior because your text messages are blue. And, and that to me becomes the, the marketing aspect of this. You didn't buy that phone because you cared about that phone or it could really just work for you. You bought that phone so that you could peacock the right way. <laughs> From a cork rain. I mean, this is also part of, part of it too. The thing is you can even own an iPad and, AirPad, uh, and AirPods Pro and that's not good enough for Apple. You have to buy their stuff for everything. Um, From Dustadore. I wouldn't fully put it under discrimination because I feel like that's a pretty loaded word, but yeah, there is definitely a huge divide with Android shaming. And Paul Purry, absolutely, marketing is a feature. <laughs> um, from Copacash, and this to me is, again, another, another aspect of this. iMessage only matters in the US, everyone, everywhere else. You, uh, blah, 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 blah. Let me try that again. Everyone everywhere else uses all the other messaging apps. And so I, I went into an Apple uh, subreddit. I think it was our iPhone. And, and I kind of just laid out, you know, hey, you know, I'm an Android user and most of my family, my immediate family are all on Androids, but my brother's fiance is the lone iPhone user in this little circle. And it's because of her, we constantly have broken RCS. So the flip side of this can also be true. It's just a shame because the carriers screwed us over Royal, fighting on different standards, delaying their rollouts of messaging apps, eventually just giving it all to Google when it was too big of a mess for them to finish up. And it's a shame because now RCS is really, really good. It's fantastic. It's an iMessage competitor. They're gonna be rolling out true end-to-end -end encryption, which is something that iMessage is, Apple has been reluctant to do. And we're, we're getting to this really great kind of nexus point where 
what would be the Yeah, it's not fun for me either. But we're getting to this really great nexus point where the carrier standard, you know, the sort of baked in network operator standard is genuinely going to be the better platform. It's just way too late. The carriers drag their heels and, and they kind of wrecked this market for everybody else. And that's a massive bummer. And so, I mean, I even got some positive feedback from other Apple users saying like, hey, you know, this, this could be better, but most of my family, we just moved to some other messaging service. And, and that's, that's the reality of, of where we're at. RCS is actually very good now. It's just too late. And, and people found other solutions because the carriers screwed us over. Um, so here, let me, um, let me go back through a few more of these chats. Unfortunately, I can't highlight the chats because the stream borked again. Um, Let's get this down to here. Uh, from Michael from McCorcoran. I once got a job at a marketing department with 17 people in it. And I was the only one using an Android phone. I was only a contractor and I stuck out like a sore thumb. These were all adults. That happens a lot in the film industry. Um, I would show up with a gaming laptop and there'd be this little razor green logo glowing at the table and everything else would be MacBooks. But I have to say like surfaces have actually started showing up a lot in production. You know, someone's walking around with a tablet and they slam it down on a keyboard dock and they, they can kind of get stuff done that way. It has shaken up a little bit, but mostly you walk into a Starbucks and you'll still see MacBooks, aspiring screenwriters plugging away on their MacBooks. And you're like, yeah, for what you're doing right now, you could have gotten a Chromebook. <laughs> you're writing at a Starbucks. Um, sure, you needed that, that you know, $2,000 laptop. <clears throat> and yeah, Michael, again, I'm pointing this out specifically. Uh, Michael says, some tech YouTubers seem to think Google brought this up, but it was a Wall Street Journal article and they're using that to dismiss the complaint. Um, Google executives shared it and I think they shared it too aggressively. So it definitely felt like a Google's trying to break iMessage kind of story, but that's not what the article is about. And again, if All right, we're gonna try this one more time. And if I need to completely close out of Chrome and try and jump right back in, we might do that too. So there might be a longer interruption as we get, as we get through this. Again, I don't know. I think this is a Chrome issue because I'm not using OBS. I'm using OBS as a virtual camera and I'm going through Restream. And I think it's not, I don't think it's Restream because I'm not seeing any issues with the connection speed. It still says my network is 10 out of 10. So I think Google's messing me up here with, with Chrome. Um, from Aditya, I feel like the blame is to be split. Google had more than a decade to make a standardized messaging service across all phones running Android. Carriers are making it difficult, I agree, but with Google Play services being a thing for almost four years now, I feel like we should have had a standard by now. Apple are really just looking after their bottom line and have made a toxic environment via a walled environment plus strong marketing tactics. I agree with you. I'm going to add to that. Google is in the unenviable position of not being able to control their end products, their, the end user experience. They make the software and the operating system, unless everyone buys a Pixel, um, they're, they're kind of constrained. And we keep seeing the cycle play out where Google, Google tries to come up with a new tech and then the carriers stonewall it. And then that gives Apple a humongous advantage and then the carriers give up and then they let Google do what they should have just let Google do from the beginning. And we saw that with Google Wallet. And the carriers created ISIS to fight it. And that whole time gave Apple two years of runway to get Apple Pay off the ground. And then the carriers went, oh, you know what? This is actually kind of hard. Ew, no, you do it. And then Google was able to get what, Android Pay or something off the ground after that. Huge, massive problem. Um, when it comes to messaging, it was the same situation. Google can kind of create these standards. They can try and say, hey, we want to make a more chat-based uh, server-side messaging solution, and we want it to play nice with your text messaging. But then the carriers went, nah, and so they had to try and create something else. 
So Google creates Allo, which is all the server side stuff, and it doesn't step on the carriers for the network base, the SMS stuff. And it, of course, it doesn't work very well. But for some reason, the carriers play ball with Apple because that is a completely locked up market, right? If Apple just says, hey, you know what? We don't want you to sell iPhones anymore. You're not gonna let us do whatever we want with messaging, then the carriers are gonna get real nervous and not, about not being able to sell iPhones. But Google saying, we wanna create this messaging protocol. Well, who are they gonna piss off? Pixel owners? That's less than 2% of all Android sales in the United States. The carriers aren't gonna care. And Samsung is ready to just say, hey, we'll give you more money to put our phones up in front and you can put on whatever messaging app you want us to use, we don't care. So it's not really, Google failed us by not being able to create a messaging solution. It was Google didn't have the clout to force carriers to play ball. They couldn't go to carriers and say, hey, you can't sell Android phones anymore because they don't, they don't make the phones. So you get stuck in that time and time and time again. Payment systems, uh, messaging apps, uh, VOIP, video calling, you're always gonna let Apple do whatever they want, and then Google has to fight to kind of reach parity after the carriers decide that it's not worth it to them to make a competing product against Apple. So there is, again, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than, oh, Google had all the time, they could have just made their own. They couldn't have. And when they tried, they often got slapped down for it because we don't work on fairness or meritocracy. <laughs> From McCorkran, yeah, again, it, you know, blaming Google here is sort of like blaming the USFL for the NFL having uh, ish policies. <laughs> Dave Burns, but that headline doesn't confirm my bias. So again, I, I think it's just one of those opportunities for us as techies to kind of reach out to family and friends to, uh, again, it's not to say I want you to like your iPhone less. I just want you to understand what Apple's business policies are. And, and I feel like outside of the tech bubbles, like once you step aside from a Reddit community that gets really toxic, about any type of criticism. You know, with my family and friends, they kind of understood. They understood why I preferred Android. I would hand them phones that were inexpensive and did everything that they wanted to do and had great cameras. And, and, and that was sort of the linchpin. You know, I, my brother and my sister are on, my brother's on a Motorola, my sister's on a Pixel, her husband's on a Pixel, my dad's on a Pixel, my mom's on a OnePlus, and my brother's fiance is on an iPhone 7. Um, no, I mean, sorry, an iPhone 8. Um, that, that's, that's how sort of better information spreads, right? That's, that's how we actually make an impact. And, and we lead people to the solutions that really matter to them. And again, that was what, for me, it started out as my dad doesn't need to buy a thousand dollar phone and he's probably gonna break it or lose it. Dad, you need to look at a Pixel. And starting with like the Pixel 2, he was on board. I'm gonna run this phone for years. It's smaller, fits in my shirt pocket. This is great. I'm actually a little concerned because like there aren't many phones left that he's gonna like um, when, when it's time for him to replace his Pixel 4a. So that, that, that's, that's joining this conversation in a meaningful way. You know, uh, stepping outside of, you know, Apple and iMessage, iMessage never worked great for us because we had a mix of Android and iOS users. That's a bad combination for messaging. And, and increasingly, my family started preferring the cheaper Android alternatives that still seemed to be just as good as their iPhones. And that's how we made progress. Um, hopefully we can keep joining these conversations so that people are finding, hey, you know what? This is actually a better fit for my needs. It's a better fit for my budget. And just as a family, we can all agree, maybe we need to switch to Telegram. Maybe I need to be on a different messaging. Maybe it's just I'm lurking in Twitter DMs. And that's, that's how we get communication going between all the family members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, it's stuff like this. Um, if someone on Tinder tells you that they don't talk broke if you use an Android, you answer that you don't talk Apple shell. Um, or I would just say, you know, 
okay, peace out. I, just, just walk away. Again, joining it only fuels the, he's just a hater. Oh, he, you know, if, if you kind of rise to the emotional, or descend, I should say, to the emotional level of that individual, you're only just feeding their, their desire to hurt people's feelings. And again, that's, that's what this kind of tribalism has become. It, it's a very insidious kind of bullying to get people in line with someone else's preferences. Um, from Zalbotnik, are you the only techie in your family? I'm the only one who's really into consumer tech. I come from a family of computer programmers and engineers and scientists and teachers. And um, I, I have to credit, you know, like even my grandmother, my grandmother uses Duo on her iPad to send video messages to my daughter. I feel like that's pretty good for a lady who's, who's gonna be turning 90 soon. So I have to acknowledge that my family is ahead of the curve on a lot of tech. Um, but again, as engineers and scientists and educators, when I go to them and say, hey, this is what I'm, you know what you should, you should do, you should check out that Pixel. And they use the Pixel, and I'm not wrong, it's a badass little phone, and it's $400 or free on a two-year contract. Um, that kind of reinforces the point. Like, it's not like I said, hey, don't use an Apple, go get a Samsung. It was, hey, you want a good basic camera and a streamlined phone, you should check this out. And then I was correct. So it's that kind of thing, like I was really listening to what they wanted or what they needed, and I found them a solution that cost a lot less than they thought they would need to pay. And that to me is the winning argument, is, is use and price, and you can often beat an iPhone. Like it's not hard. Pixel 5a, right now. <laughs> Monster phone. And, and again, it, you, would, you would really find few individuals who would have a, an issue with that kind of price to feature set. Yeah, Michael, I would definitely not want to date someone that shallow. <laughs> Dustadore, replying that way is how you become a screenshot meme. Uh, Aditi, you know, the Bagnell family is pretty tech savvy. I mean, I gotta, I gotta give credit where credit's due. You know, I was the black sheep of the family that wanted to go off and be a performer and a dancer and eventually just came back to audio engineering. Um, so yeah, I, I'm the slow one in the family. Um, yeah, exactly. From 2Turbo. It's absurdly good for anyone who is almost 90. Uh, yeah, my, my grandmother is, is a dynamo. She's constantly screenshotting things. She's, in, she's engaged on these like genealogy forums. The iPad was, was like the perfect fit. She was always like into computers and word processing and tech, you know, even from the very, very, very beginning. Um, but when we put a slate in her hands, it just, she just took it to a whole other level. So again, I mean, to me, that's, that's an impressive win. Like that is exactly where the iPad excels as a portable computing product. Um, but again, it's her use. She wanted to do more. She's not just sitting there like watching Netflix on a tablet screen. She is recording things and shooting video and shooting photos and engaged with forums and communities. Um, she's taken a back seat from social media and she's just gone back to perusing individual websites. I mean, it's, it, it is really impressive. And if you reach someone with the things that they are inclined to do and you show them the tech that can do it, you're gonna have positive results. <clears throat> Paul Purry, in the future, every phone is an iPhone, hashtag Taco Bell. <laughs> oh, I need to rewatch Demolition Man, that movie's great. All right, uh, getting into the, to the uh, one other little story here for the gadget block. I'm not putting a lot on this story. I really don't like leakers. I don't think it's good content. I think it's kind of miserable going through rumors and leaks and basically just people who exist in our community to get to, to make money on being first. Like that's all they have to provide to the conversation is they showed up in, in the video and they dropped the comment first and then they ran away. And that's it. Um, I like it when a press announcement has a surprise or there's something that we didn't know, and that's what leakers all try to wreck, is that discovery. So this is coming by way of Ice Universe, but it was written by Daniel Petrov over at Phone Arena. 
Uh, leaker dishes out on Samsung's Exynos 2200 with AMD GPU performance, then deletes the tweets. So according to Ice Universe and his tweets, um, at present, the results of the Galaxy S22 test show that performance of AMD GPU is even worse than that of the Dimensity 9000 using a Mali and far behind the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 and A15. Um, someone else asks, how about the CPU performance? And Ice writes, still the worst flagship processor. So we've got some major issues uh, in the smartphone SOC game. The 8 Gen 1, the Qualcomm Snapdragon, actually does look to be an impressive improvement for graphics processing. It's still thirstier and runs hotter, but has now caught and in some cases can exceed the performance of the A15. We're talking roughly a 40% jump in graphics processing from the A88 to the 8 Gen 1 on some of these early tests that people are using that Motorola for. And I don't have a lot of faith in Motorola's ability to optimize for the 8 Gen 1 because they did not play at all with the A88. So <laughs> I'm going to get a little deeper into the weeds here. Uh, looking at Samsung strategy, going with an AMD GPU, this is the first generation of that. And I think AMD has shown that they can make excellent um, you know, uh, CPU and GPU units um, small form factor, chiplet, um, I, I'm forgetting what, what you call that when you put an AMD unit into like a, like a game console. Anyway, um, very good performance to power, very good price to performance. AMD is very good at this. And they kind of rule the console market. That's how good they are at this. But this is also going to be the first generation of this idea going into a phone when Qualcomm and MediaTek are aggressively looking at ways to improve performance. So I'm very concerned about power. I think we're gonna see like 10% better CPU power at like 20% more power draw or 15% higher thermals. That, that to me is a big concern. The GPU side of this looks like it actually might be a little bit better. So we'll have to see how that's actually implemented when we see a Galaxy S22 in Europe versus a Galaxy S22 in the United States. So, um, APUs, thank you. <laughs> Homers and Millhouses, that, that, that's pretty funny, Aditya. Nicely done. <laughs> so yeah, um, I, I'm not putting a ton of stock into Ice Universe really comprehensively uh, reviewing uh, mobile SOCs. I, again, right now we're barely out of, this is the Geekbench score. See, it's 40% more betters. And I need to see like more, you know, video editing and rendering. I need to see photo editing and manipulation. There was recently an update to Photomate that, that noticeably improved like image stacking, HDR compositing, and a median. Uh, so you can like cut out things from your photos. Like, Again, if you like Lightroom, $9 for Photomate is a really good buy right now. But what I'm hoping to see is by the time this gets to the OnePlus 10, to the Galaxy S22, to the numerous Xiaomi phones that are gonna, that, that are gonna have the 8 Gen 1, I hope what, what we get is a, a low power mode that drops us to the CPU performance of the 865 at a noticeable power savings. The performance we need day to day is not very high, but we need the optimization and the efficiency to bring those temperatures lower, to let the ISP do its own work for the camera side and not constantly kicking on the CPU and GPU to their max limits. And from there, we'd get ridiculously good phones. When I flip a switch on the OnePlus 9 Pro and I say high performance mode, and things get faster for a limited period of time, I need the turbo button, right? You know, on the front of the PC case. That's what I want. And then for most of the time, I'd really be fine on the lowest power efficiency cores. I don't need Twitter to open up a fraction of a microsecond faster. I need Twitter to use less power. And if I could just keep Twitter on the five series cores instead of the seven series cores or the X1 core, that's way better for me and I'm fine 
Twitter taking a second longer to open and populate with new tweets. That is not a mission priority for me to have the, the mostest powerfulest. But when I open up my video rendering software, I need that to cook as fast as I can to get my projects finished. Yo, know, see, this is this is just it. You know, like I, I this is why I keep dividing lines between like average consumer reviewers versus rational techies. Uh, two turbo writes, I think a lot of techies truly don't care about peak performance. It's the journalists who make money on more outrageous titles. And if you go to more rational techies, they're the ones that are making these smarter purchasing decisions for themselves. You know, like I want a Snapdragon 870 in a Poco. I don't want a Snapdragon 888 in a Xiaomi, right? They're dividing those lines. I'm look at like a Pixel forum, and people are so you know kind of tweaky about the Pixel Six. But then you see this love fest for the Pixel Five A. This is a phone that's generating all of this positive goodwill in the community, where we've got the concerns and and the delayed software and the updates and the Tensor chip. Mm, I don't know on the Pixel Six. So when we get out of the basic reviewers, and I say basic as an insult, um, with all respect, when we get out of those basic reviewers and we start looking at like, well, what do you use? What do you really want in a phone? What features do you need? Mid-ranger performance and better battery life is almost always the winning argument over the mostest, fastest, hottest performance, but with reduced battery life. And and that to me, it's, it's just like, I'm bashing my head against a wall whenever I, I, I put out like a commentary like that and then my YouTube comments are just full of, but that's a scam. I, I would have put in a better processor and I need more power. And you're like, but why? <laughs> I know why I want more power. I'm genuinely trying to replace a laptop here. You're, you're talking about like Genshin Impact and social media. Why? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh, uh, Twitter spaces conversations. <laughs> my Gormlord, my hobby is watching benchmarks run, though. <laughs> if that were true, I don't know that we could be friends. <laughs> um... Oh, let me get this out of the way. <laughs> and Gabaletta, absolutely. I think I think we're all on the same page here. I don't, I don't think you're you're being controversial. Gabaletta writes to clarify: when I say techies, I'm talking to the uninformed that just follow trends and benchmarks instead of real world usage. It's the disdain I have for people who just memorize specs and then complain about the price for those specs without actually understanding what it's like using that product. And and again. Now, my uncle has a Galaxy S9. He just bought another Galaxy S9. That's the phone he likes. He's got a spare because he knows his phone is getting a little older. And it was cheaper to buy a whole other Galaxy S9 than to... Uh, there's a tiny crack in the front of his screen and a battery that he wants to replace. So his, S, his current S9 is, is aging out. It was cheaper to just buy a whole other Galaxy S9. And that's the phone he wants. I, I'm, I'm, I keep telling people, like... If they were on a premium flagship tier phone, the S9 or S10 era, you know, LG G7s, I think another perfect example, unless there's something they really want to do that would replace another piece of tech, like a tablet or a laptop, stay at that same performance level and your battery and costs go way higher. So if you go from a Snapdragon 845 to a Snapdragon 700 series, it's all gravy. You spent less, you have the same power performance, and your battery life takes a huge jump. And it's, it's yeah, I'm just kind of like, th this is pretty easy to grasp. It's the sort of most toxic community of hater techies that can't seem to understand average consumers are already making those kinds of choices and walking away from the enthusiasts that always keep talking about, I need the best cameras to take poorly composed photos of fire hydrants for blog posts. 
Unfortunately, Copacash, uh, Copacash writes, do people still rely on benchmarks to determine how a device runs in day-to-day -day activities? They do, and they fundamentally don't understand what that benchmark is actually telling them. Um, oh, I gotta get another drink of water here. Hold on one. And, and Michael, again, this is the point. Um, I'll see people comment about how they haven't upgraded from their Note 9 or S9, and I think they might be in for a rude awakening if they get the FE or an S21 or an S22 base model. And again, like I think my uncle is a pretty good example of this. Um, he was seriously considering getting a new phone. And he went and looked, and the, the phone and the size and the price that he wanted to pay, this did not look like a better phone to him. It looked like a worse phone. And the only thing I wish I could have snuck in and said, hey, you probably could have jumped up to an S10. Because the S10e, ew, I've got schmutz on my S10e. I spilled coffee all over my desk right before jumping onto this podcast. Um, the S10e is kind of the last Samsung I enjoyed using. The, uh, the LG G8 is objectively a better phone than the S10e. Um, it, it, only people who are terrible at tech would say that the S10e was a better phone than the LG G8. <laughs> um, but the S10e is has kind of become my return to Samsung um, example device. I I like this phone. The hardware fingerprint sensor. I like using DeX on it. The camera still has that really cute trick of having an adjustable aperture. There's so much here that is way better. It's a way better experience overall than going to an S21. The S21 is barely more powerful if you turn off the super high power battery draining mode. The S10e is a way more feature complete device. And, and, and that matters more to me day to day. So I kind of wish my uncle maybe would have picked one of those up, go from an S9 to an S10, but the S10 would be the cutoff. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, Tech Love and Mama. See, again, she, she's good at tech, so her kids are good at tech too. My 18-year-old and 16-year-old sons have had Note 10 Plus for over a year. 18-year-old uh, has had his since launch, and neither child wants or cares for an upgrade. I ask every birthday and Christmas. They love their phones still. Again, that means you did it right as a parent. Everyone say, hey, Tech Love and Mama, she's doing it right. <laughs> and Raymond, it's still running his LG V30. Um, uh, let me get this out of the way here. Um, Gormlord, I keep seeing the 8 Gen 1 reach 1 million on N22, so <laughs> I've, I've, I've not installed N22 since I was at Pocket Now. So yeah, it's been like four years since I've had N22 on a phone. It is such a, a miserable conversation point. I, I still kind of rely on Geekbench to show how a bigger Geekbench score does not relate to real world performance. So when you really tax a phone, it doesn't matter if it got a big Geekbench score. Some phones perform these things better and some phones perform poorer and that's not predicted by a synthetic benchmark. <laughs> Simon, a 1 million N22 score makes Sudoku super fast. You know, me and my wife, we still play a lot of Boggle. Um, there's the totally free Gobble. It's a version of Boggle, and you can kind of sync up with another player and play the same board at the same time. Totally free, no ads, no in-app purchases. It's it's really, really good. Gobble. Um, you know, that that's, a, that's an app that runs well on, like, a Snapdragon 400. <laughs> like, woo, it's a good thing I've got these 888s sitting in front of me here so I can play gobble with my wife. <laughs> Dave Burns, <laughs> you nerd. Dave writes, no one, the S10 doesn't have, checks notes, uh, I'll be back. <laughs> so the S10 doesn't have 5G. It's got great cameras. It's got a headphone jack. It's got removable storage. Um, yeah, the S10s are, are better phones than the S20s and S21s. It's, that is the least controversial thing I could say right now.
So McCorkrain, I mean, like I, I can kind of, I can kind of hang with iterative improvements, right? So, so McCorkrain writes, I don't know why people care so much about these iterative improvements and processing when they're not using their phones for desktop applications or productivity anyway, because there are things that do matter. Like we should be seeing iterative, iterative improvements for radio management and battery life. And those little camera upgrades and tweaks, they can add up over time. But right now we're not seeing iterative improvements to the entire lifestyle of owning a smartphone. We're seeing iterative improvements to the cameras and then cutting other features. So iterative improvements to camera tech and then a massive downgrade for removable storage and headphone jack. We're seeing iterative improvements to the quality of the displays and then cutting resolution because who can even see all those pixels? You know, that's, that's what's so frustrating to me is over the last two years, we've seen this kind of peak and we're not really getting better overall phones. We're just trading some improvements for some deficits. And we're kind of just in this wacky holding pattern. And so when a company, I don't think I've got it on my desk, when a company like Sony still keeps all the bells and whistles in their phones and in radically increases resolution and works to have a very different software experience for the cameras and you still have removable storage and a headphone jack and uh, water resistance and stereo speakers, like that needs to be a bigger deal. But instead, it's not about that phone being better. It's about Sony isn't as popular a brand and I won't make as much money with a Sony video as I will with a Samsung video. So this phone must not be worth it for the monies. Mm -hmm -hmm. And that to me is, is, the, is the factor that kills so much tech enthusiasm, especially from the average consumers that these reviewers claim to care about. Ah, TK, everyone say, hey, TK, if he's in the chat. Sabaho. That was a terrible way of saying Sabaho. Get this out of the way here. We've got some other. So uh, we're getting down to the last 20 minutes. Who wants to talk about the OnePlus 10? Anyone? I mean, we all hate the OnePluses now, right? Because they're basically just Oppos and the Oppoification of OnePlus is now complete. And it doesn't matter if they're better phones with better software and better features. It, it only matters that my feelings have been betrayed. And now I'm going to go to another brand that wouldn't have fulfilled my feelings of, that I had for the OnePlus. The Oppo 10, that's right, Gary. We're, we should all be emotionally fraught with the state of OnePlus. <sighs> I know, I'm, I'm just, it, it's gutting me. Um, my OnePlus 9 Pro has had a couple like minor patches now. I, I had the Android 12 right out of the gate. I did not suffer any of the major issues that people were complaining about when OnePlus pulled the update. But since I've gotten a small patch to catch me up to the re-release and then one other small patch and this phone has never run better. Still some gremlins, uh, live caption is broken. I think Dave Burns was talking about that too. <laughs> Dave writes, the OnePlus 10 personally kicked my dog. What a garbage phone. Um, but I'm kind of basing some of my OnePlus 10 conversation on the incredibly positive experiences I've had over the year with a OnePlus 9 Pro. Um, this is a phone that undercut the price of a Galaxy S21 Ultra and competed pretty close to the Ultra. I think it's a better overall phone than an S21 Plus, which launched at like near the same price as the OnePlus 9. It has been... a uh, often fraught with controversies like the throttling, um, the CPU throttling and the GPU limiting uh, that OnePlus engaged in. But when I used the phone, it did power user things faster than my Galaxy and it ran cooler, with the exception of the camera, it ran cooler than my Galaxy in a number of situations. The, the GPU was limited, but I still had a higher peak uh, performance frame rate for the games that I like to play than I could get on a Galaxy. And again, it's in a ballpark where it's trying to trade blows with uh, iPhones and iPhone Pros. The ultra-wide camera sensor on the OnePlus 9 Pro is larger than the main camera sensor on the iPhone 13 Pro. This is an excellent all-rounder 
device. So we're getting into the OnePlus 10. The announcement's gonna be tomorrow. I don't think there are gonna be any major surprises, but I did wanna highlight, here, let me get this out of the way. And because uh, Pete Lau basically just showed all the specs. <laughs> so we're, we're getting a, a, a nudge to the battery. We're going to go up to a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, uh, LPDDR5 and UFS 3.1. Um, we're, we're keeping a, a 120 hertz display, but with LTPO, second generation, excuse me, second generation LTPO, reverse wireless charging. Um, wireless charging at 50 watts, cabled charging at 80 watts, uh, stereo speakers, uh, Bluetooth 5.2, 32 megapixel front camera, and they're not telling us what's in it, but it's the second generation Hasselblad camera system, uh, 48 megapixels for the main sensor, 50 megapixels for the ultra wide, and 8 megapixels for the telephoto. So, when we add all this up, oh, and I'm sorry, the Snapdragon uh, 8 Gen 1. So this to me is gonna be one of the proper true tests of Qualcomm's new chipset. Uh, OnePlus did a pretty good job reining in the 888. Again, I'm getting to the OnePlus 9 Pro here. The camera performance always ran a little toasty. So you had to shoot in short clips if you were shooting 4K 60 or 4K 120, but this is literally one of only two phones. It's the OnePlus 9 Pro and the Sony Xperia Pro I that can shoot 4K 120. And 4K 120 is really fun to play with if you like speed ramping and slow motion footage and awesome resolution while you do it. So the OnePlus 9 always ran kind of hot. You had a five minute limit on 4K video. Sometimes you couldn't even make it to that five minute limit before you'd get a thermal warning. And that's kind of gone now. So on ColorOS, on, on Android 12, the OnePlus 9 Pro no longer has a time limit on 4K 60 video. And I shot like a seven minute clip just to see, and it ran fine. And I didn't get a thermal warning like I used to get pretty aggressively on Android 11. Like I said, almost everything is now demonstrably, as in I can demonstrate it better on Color OS than we were on Oxygen OS. Gremlins, sure. Anything outside the, you know, crazy outside the realm of Android 12 updates? No. In fact, if you think about it, OnePlus is doing better with Android 12 than Google is. So again, let's keep our criticisms in perspective. I think the, the Fold finally just got a more, a wider release for Android 12. Samsung had to pull their Android 12 release for their most expensive phone. Every company is going through some kind of teething pain. So what, what I think is where we're going to see, there was a rumor that we might see a larger camera sensor on the OnePlus 10 Pro. We'll have to see, um, especially if we can kind of nudge it up to like the same sort of size as like a Vivo. That would be kind of cool if BBK brands all sort of standardized on the larger one over 1.3 inch sensors that would be that would be pretty sweet we already saw sort of a a leak tear down that oneplus is working to put in more thermal managing hardware which again with a snapdragon if you want it to be the most powerful it's going to be running kind of hot so that would be kind of cool if there was just better thermal thermal handling hardware built into the phone i'm assuming it's going to be a little bit heavier it's going to be maybe just a fraction chunkier to put in a larger battery and a copper shield and those graphite pads and, and really try and get heat out of the phone. But again, this is where we have to see performance isn't just, oh, the phone runs hot. You know, like uh, the Razer phone, the Razer 2 was kind of cool. Um, the phone was hot to the touch, but it was getting heat out of the phone. So your performance stayed more consistent over a longer period of, a period of time. If OnePlus can do something similar, we're going to see a bunch of people saying, oh, this phone is really hot, and you touch it, and oh, it's so toasty. But did we see performance degrade? And that, to me, is going to be um, the, the biggest challenge for OnePlus and other brands, like OnePlus and Xiaomi especially, um, moving forward on this new Snapdragon. 
So I, I, I thought it was kind of cool. You know, the specs, that's only a part of the story. We want to see what software initiatives OnePlus has, that they keep up with updates. They've been doing a great job supporting the OnePlus 9s. Um, we want to see, like, what, what, what is it that's going to be an improvement All right, so we had a full system crash. That was beautiful. Uh, computer's rebooting right now. And then we can get back. I, this is again, like all my chat just got wiped. I'm gonna I'm just pull up Rome here real quick. And then, uh, oh, let me, oh, let, me um, let me start that NVIDIA. Let me start my NVIDIA broadcast first. We're gonna have some some wonkiness here because I'm, I'm you know switching mics back and forth, and then uh, we'll we'll see if we can get the stream back. That that one was brutal, like full just classic blue screen. Here, real quick, here, real quick. And can people still hear me if I pull my mic and go off the phone? Someone someone let me know if uh, if I just vanished, the audio just vanished. Do do do. Anyone, anyone, Bueller, 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 better, better, we good? All right, okay, so I've got the microphone doing it live, doing it live. And we're gonna have to see like what's going on with these blue screens, because it's, uh, it's pretty gross. Let me get back into the room, and then I'm not even going to worry about pulling up links and, and other things. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll wrap the show up because we're getting just to the last ten minutes again. It happened again in the last ten minutes. Ugh, ugh, indeed. All right, almost back in. I need Nvidia. Let's see. I think that's me. I'm showing levels. I'm showing signs of life. Gonna enter the studio. Ha <laughs> That was awesome. So yeah, one plus ten pro. <laughs> um yeah, sorry guys, completely lost the chat. I have no idea where we were, what folks were saying. Um, let, let's, let's wrap up the podcast just starting fresh. If you'd recently left a comment about the OnePlus 10 Pro, let's chat about the OnePlus 10 Pro. Um, but yeah, apparently, Tiger Cam, I've pissed off every big tech platform uh, with my anti-capitalist you know, uh, capitalist, uh, left-wing nerd rage. I'm even wearing my, like, Kangol version of a revolutionary hat. <laughs> the Illuminati just made everyone aware that they're watching. So, uh, major announcement, OnePlus 10 Pro being released tomorrow. Really excited to see what OnePlus is going to be doing for a mainstream flagship phone. They haven't, since the OnePlus 7, they haven't been a flagship killer brand. So let's stop pretending that this is somehow the sweetheart darling enthusiast label that they used to be. 
They still, I think, offer a very good bang for buck. They often undercut the pricing of Apple and Samsung. There's still a, a flavor of the OnePlus mission still around. But increasingly, since the OnePlus 7, this has been an arm of BBK manufacturing for specific regions, not an enthusiast label. So what, what, are, what are our feelings on that? What do you think we're going to see tomorrow from OnePlus? Are there going to be any surprises? They've taken all the specs off the table. I think one of the surprises might be a larger main camera sensor. Uh, there are rumors that they might be moving up to the same uh, 1 over 1.28 1 over 1 inch camera sensors that we're, we're seeing on a few competing products. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm angsty about this because to me, the mission should be, do we get a better phone? Not, does my phone launcher define who I am as a person? So what do we think that they might be using the OnePlus label for? You know, again, OnePlus sells in some regions, Oppo sells in some regions. There are a few areas where Oppo and OnePlus sell in the same region, but here in the United States, we're gonna hear about the OnePlus 10, and then we're probably gonna be lower on the list of countries to actually receive it. Like, I think we're gonna see flavors for India and for China first, and then a version of this will be made available for pre-order, and we're going to be a little bit later uh, to getting the OnePlus 10. Yeah, Arthur Lee. I find it foolish that people still think of OnePlus as the flagship killer brand. It just kind of, they get all caught up in the emotion of what that used to be. And if that's what you want, I mean, like, a Poco is such a good deal. Go get a Poco. But acting like this, this corporation betrayed you as a customer because they're now making more mainstream products just reeks of that music fandom that I absolutely hate. Like, oh, I liked this band before they were cool. So you just wanted them to never be successful and to never find a larger audience? Did you really like that band? Because that sounds terrible. And, and that to me feels like what OnePlus is stuck in here in the United States. And the rest of the world kind of moved on. <laughs> you know, like... The, OnePlus in India is selling like crazy. OnePlus is up 400% in, um, in most of the EU. Sales year over year, I think globally, are up over 200%. Walking away from enthusiasts was the best thing OnePlus could have done. Um, Dave Burns wants a OnePlus 10. Gary the Fireman, maybe we'll see a OnePlus Fold, maybe. You think a BBK would use the OnePlus label to do a folding phone? I think, I think Oppo will become the experimental, like an Oppo Find is going to be the balls to the wall, crazy experiment label. And that OnePlus is going to be a more mainstream product line. That's my guess. That's where BBK will divide Oppo versus OnePlus. I think that's what we're, what we're likely to see. Uh, <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, the OnePlus Note Ultra SGG Snark Edition. I would put my name on that phone just to watch people, like, tear their hair out. Oh, but it's not a Samsung, so it can't be as gooder. <laughs> I thought OnePlus sounded better on vinyl. <laughs> no, unfortunately. So DTNL writes, wait, could Juan be leading us on this pointless tangent whilst having a pre-embargo unit in the lab? Blink in a 7-8 rhythm if you have the OnePlus 10 in the SGG lab. So like, here, I'll blink a waltz. Mm, 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 mm. I do not have a OnePlus 10. I really wish I did, um, but it makes me sad. Again, as a more mainstream product category, and with most of my previous OnePlus relationships having moved on to other companies, unfortunately, I don't know that I'll be high on the list. So OnePlus is going to go for the big clicks, right? So they're going to send their phone out to reviewers who have every vested interest in not promoting uh, the OnePlus uh, current mission and satisfying the bias of their audiences. And they'll be all excited because that'll still generate sales. It'll generate more sales than my audience can generate. But the enthusiast conversation, I think, is going to be increasingly toxic for OnePlus this year as, uh, as we still need to have whipping boy brands. OnePlus and Sony, 
well, they're obviously always going to be the losers in comparisons against Samsung and Xiaomi. Um, it, it's just, it, 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 it sucks. I mean, again, if I could be a part of that earlier surge, I mean, yeah, it would be good for my channel, but I also feel it would be kind of a more fun counterpoint because it's so easy to predict like what the negative reviews of these products are gonna be. That's how like manipulated the review game is. Microsoft called it with the Duo One. They could perfectly predict what reviewers were going to pan the device on, and they just took all that away in the early embargo days. You know, people's oh, that's Microsoft trying to manipulate the market. Well, no, that's how manipulated the market is. That Microsoft could predict it. <laughs> you know, like again, we want to put our ire properly on on the mechanisms at play. Ooh, Matt Tyler, that's a that's a good, uh, you know, I I would put money on that. That's a that's a good bet. Uh, Matt Tyler writes, I think Realme will be BBK's experimental foldable push. Again, if you release a cheaper foldable, the Realme label would be a good way to kind of drum up some of that. Um, yeah, and Copper Cash, the Oppo Find N is a killer foldable. And we're waiting on Android 12L, and then we'll probably see Oppo start putting out hardware like that to other regions. It looks really cool. I know TK was in here for a while, but um, he's been playing with one, and the hardware looks phenomenal. <laughs> Dave Burns. Um, it really sucks that tech YouTube is imploding because of all the cool consumer electronics getting released. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer, you know? Um, Increasingly, especially here in the United States, we're going to matter less and less. And a part of this, I'm not saying it's their fault, but a part of this is because of the way that a couple companies like Samsung and Apple have manipulated YouTube metrics and Google SEO to promote their products above others, which makes it more profitable for YouTube reviewers to always toe the line of only a couple companies and not really give consistent or fair assessments for other brands. And then those other brands go, but why would we even want to fight there? The United States looks awful. We have to deal with carriers. The tech reviewers are the worst. And we can make way more money globally. Xiaomi, number one smartphone sales inter internationally, zero presence in the United States. That's how inconsequential the United States is to the global sales right now. You're not finding a lot of newer consumers here. You're having to fight Apple. And as we just saw, Apple gets every special consideration for carriers here in the United States. So who would wanna play that game? If you care about tech and competition, you're, you're gonna be wrecked here in the United States. Yeah, CTK has that Oppo. He says it's the right size for a foldable. Love it. <laughs> See, Arthur Lee. I mean, I, I do the same. My One of my highest viewed videos is me talking about how I won't review the new iPhone coming out. That's how thirsty YouTube is for iPhone content. Um, Arthur writes, I can vouch for the popularity of Samsung and Apple. I posted videos and articles on Samsung products and those are my most viewed content. Um, <laughs> um, again, it's, it's like the media literacy of this has to become a part of every tech review that we do now. And again, it's why I'm increasingly looking at other, other things to talk about, you know, my little tech talks and how to's and tips and tricks and knowing that those videos are going to do garbage traffic. Um, but it is the initiative that I'm trying to set up on somegadgetguy.com. You can go to somegadgetguy.com slash subscribe. I still maintain all of my playlists. So if you would prefer to just, you know, follow my headphone reviews, for example, you can subscribe, or I mean, there's a playlist just for my audio reviews, but you can dump playlists into a lot of podcasting apps or feeder reader apps, and I've got the RSS feeds there too. So if you want real notifications on the content that I produce and you want to manicure which videos of mine that you get, you can't do that on YouTube. I had to go and make my own list on my own blog, and that's where you go, somegadgetguy.com slash subscribe. So speaking of headphones, um, uh, I wanna put this out. The full contest 
mechanics will be published with the show notes. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave away a phone and literally one person uh, submitted uh, a contest entry to win a phone and they won that phone. Speaking of, I actually need to pack that phone and ship it to them still. <laughs> I suck. So this week, I want to give away some really nice earbuds. These are the Eco Opal OH2s. I have a review on these Ecos. The Ecos are great cabled IEMs. I love Eco products. They make a great DAC. They sent me a couple extra pairs. These are still sealed, like plastic wrapped and everything. They have not been opened. So I'm going to give away a pair of these. This next contest, again, because we're not getting a lot of traffic and we're not getting a lot of support and a lot of sharing, is, is I can only ship to the United States for these, give, for these earbuds. I'm hoping that the other pair that I have to give away, we can make an international contest out of later. But to start, USA only, Eco OH2. What you're gonna need to do is share uh, my Eco OH2 review somewhere publicly, and then on the show notes for this week's podcast episode, in the comments, drop me a comment with a link to where you shared my review. I don't care where you share it. It could be on Twitter, it could be on Facebook, it could be, um, it could be on Reddit, it could be on anywhere that you can click on a link. If you can still get into Google+, you can go and share it on Google+, and someone can click on it. For every place that you share it, I'll count that as a contest entry. So that's what we're gonna do. But, I mean, you can get ahead of the sharing right now, but you have to leave a comment on the post for this week's podcast showing me where you shared my Eco OH2 review. And I'll draw someone at random next week. We'll, we'll give this away. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we have a little fun with this. I want to do giveaways for people that are already in this community, less giveaways that you know, will win, be won by contest junkies. Like I don't care about contest junkies. Um, Matt Tyler, that's not international hate, man. You and me specifically have had the worst experiences shipping products to each other internationally. Um, if I'm gonna go through all of the shenanigans of shipping out and dealing with like, you know, taxes and fees and imports and duties and, and, and packaging and all that stuff, um, that's gonna be, that, that's a lot of effort on my part for, you know, one person to put in a contest entry on a smartphone giveaway that I had. So, <laughs> Matt, if you, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll say you can enter the contest from anywhere in the world, but I'm only going to ship to the United States. So, Matt, if, if you want me to, I'll ship them to Sam and Sam can deal with shipping them to you. So, uh, it, it's, it's pretty great. <laughs> Dave Burns happens to live in the United States. So, um, like I said, the, the post for this uh, podcast usually goes live the day after we do the live broadcast with all the replay. Uh, if, you share a com if you share the review and you leave a comment with a link to where you shared the review, you're entered into the contest and we'll announce a winner next week. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week's episode before my computer blue screens again. Uh, thanks everyone so much for hanging in there because this one was definitely choppy. It was, a, it was a rough ride for all of us, but we made it. We got to the end. Uh, I'm going to be live tweeting uh, the OnePlus announcement tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. And we've got a ton of fun videos coming up, some camera stuff, my Surface Duo 2 camera stuff, um, and some follow-ups on some other products. I, I'm, I'm a little scattered and I'm trying to wrap this up. So, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And especially to everybody who was supporting, throwing out some some tier one subs uh, and, and, and keeping this chat really fun and healthy and lively. Uh, folks, still crazy out there. Uh, for the foreseeable future, it's gonna continue to be crazy. So be safe, take care of yourselves so that you can take care of others. And I'll catch you back here next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be safe, be well, and I'll catch you back. I love y'all.